Okay, so welcome to this short afternoon session with only two talks. And the first talk is by Viswanath Nagarajan on the machine scheduling problem. So please. Thank you. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me and organizing this wonderful event. This is joint work with uh, three other people. Anupam Gupta, who is a professor at CMU. Amit Kumar, who is a professor in IIT Delhi. And Shankun Shen, who is a PhD student at Michigan working with me. And uh, thanks are due to Shankun for making all of the slides. I'm just recycling them. <laughs> so we're going to talk about a classic scheduling problem, uh, which uh, I like to call load balancing, because it basically defines the whole problem. You have a set of jobs. Every job uh, has some processing time on every possible machine, and you want to assign the jobs onto machines so that you minimize the maximum load. This makes span minimization. Uh, a special case of this problem where every job has the same processing time on every machine uh, was first studied by Graham in the 60s, and this was one of the first papers in approximation algorithms. So in this example, uh, each job has a label, which is the set of machines on which it can go, and its width is the processing time. So this green job could go either on machine A or B, but not on C or D. And you want to find an assignment that minimizes the maximum load. One possible assignment could be this, and that is your maximum load. And that's the objective that you want to make. So this is just what I described formally. So the data is PIJ, which is the processing time of job J on machine I. Throughout the talk, J is going to be for a job, and I is going to be for a machine. The simplest setting is when all the PIJs are just PJs, so they are only dependent on the job. That's called identical machines. The next harder case is where the PIJ matrix has rank 1. And this is called the related machines case. And you can think of this as jobs having inherent sizes. Machines having inherent speeds, and the processing time is the size divided by speed. And the general case uh, where the matrix can have any rank is unrelated machines. Uh, we are not going to talk about exactly this problem. Uh, we are going to look at a particular stochastic model, uh, which is hopefully more realistic because in real life, uh, it's hard to get precise data, so people look at various different optimization models that can incorporate uncertainty. So these are three general models, stochastic, robust, and online, and we're going to look at a stochastic model. So specifically, uh, we are given job size distributions, so replace every PIJ by an XIJ, and the XIJ is an independent random variable. And we will consider arbitrary distributions for this job. We, we don't need to assume any specific form of the distribution. And we want to find an assignment, an a priori assignment of jobs to machines, so that we will now minimize the expected mix span. So this, uh, the term inside the expectation is the mix span under a particular realization. And when you take the expectation or the randomness, you get the expected mix span. So even for the same job, um how long it takes on another machine is independent? It's independent, but it could also be correlated because in a particular assignment, you are only going to actually assign a job to a single machine. Mm -hmm. So it, it wouldn't matter even if it was correlated. But across jobs, definitely we need right. to be independent. So here's an example assignment. Uh, when you make this, this assignment, you don't know what the instantiations are going to be. Um, and you look at one particular instantiation, that's the mix span under the instantiation, you take an expectation over that. Is the problem definition clear? So when, whenever we look at stochastic optimization problems, a natural approach is to take every random variable and replace it by some deterministic value. And that should give you your same old deterministic optimization problem solve that problem. Hopefully, we know how to do that. If we are talking about stochastic, we should have already solved the deterministic problem. And then we could just hope to use the very same solution as a candidate solution for the stochastic problem. Okay, so that's the first thing we should try. And the natural candidate, I think everyone will agree, is just expected size. So turns out this is not a great idea, even in the simplest setting of identical machines. 
And it's useful, useful to look at these examples, although there is some amount of calculation, but I'll just give the main idea. I won't bore you with the calculations. So let's consider M jobs and, sorry, M machines and little more than M jobs. There are going to be two types of jobs. The blue jobs are going to be deterministic with size one. So these are identical jobs. So it's going to take size one or processing time one on every machine. And we have the red jobs, which are random. So it's going to take size one with probability one over square root of n. Otherwise, it's going to have a size of zero. Uh, we have m minus square root m blue jobs. So they, they are deterministic and size one and m jobs of the red type, which have expectation one over square root m. So if we just treat them as deterministic jobs with those expectations, this is a nice packing. We have a make span of one. The first m minus square root m machines uh, will have a load of one uh, because of the blue jobs and the remaining will also have a load of one because of the red jobs. So if you view this assignment in the stochastic setting, it's not hard to see that the expected make span is actually log m over log log m. And the reason is because, uh, so for the blue jobs, nothing will change. That's deterministically one. But if you look at the load on any of these machines, it's the sum of a certain number of Bernoulli random variables. And that's going to behave like a Poisson random variable with rate one. The mean here is one. And you're looking at the max of square root m independent Poisson random variables. And that has expectation log n divided by log n. Okay, so, so the fact that you just looked at expectation could mislead you into this kind of assignment. Why do I say mislead? Because you could do a better assignment, which is smearing both the deterministic jobs and the random jobs evenly. So in the deterministic sense, it's slightly suboptimal because you now have a one plus a little bit as the deterministic mix span. But in the stochastic sense, you're going to have an expected mix span which is at most true. Because in fact, even the worst case realization of this is not going to exceed two. So just expectation is not going to be enough for us if you want to get an approximation factor that's better than that. So is log like the worst case for this naive algorithm? Yeah, log, so if you just go by, uh, yeah, so you can prove that is also an upper bound for this algorithm. Other questions on this example? So it turns out that the right thing to do is to use uh, something that's known in the literature as the effective size of random variables. I'll define it formally in a few slides. And this has been used extensively in the queuing theory literature. And it was also used in the context of load balancing in a beautiful paper by Kleinberg, Rabani, and Tardish. And we're going to extend uh, those techniques uh, to the unrelated machine setting. What's known about this problem? In the deterministic setting, uh, for identical machines, uh, we now know that there is a polynomial time approximation scheme. Uh, it's NP hard, so we can't do better. In the related machines, again, there is a polynomial time approximation scheme. <laughs> for unrelated machines, uh, the problem becomes now APX hard, so we can't hope for such a tight approximation. And the best approximation we know is just a factor to approximation in a substantial special case of this, which is called the restricted assignment problem, we can estimate the optimal value to within a factor that's good. So this is the state of art for the deterministic problem. Moving to the stochastic side, uh, this paper by Kleinberg, Rabani, and Tardash gave a constant approximation when you are in the setting of identical machines. So now every xij is simply an xj, and you just want to uh, load balance across identical parallel machine. And one uh, sort of uh, reason why the stochastic setting could be harder than deterministic is that even if you're given a specific assignment, it is sharply hard to evaluate the objective in the stochastic setting. And if you assume some specific form of the job distributions, then people could do better. Uh, for example, with Poisson or exponential uh, distributed jobs, you can get uh, a two or uh, one plus epsilon approximations. But we will be interested in the case where the distributions are arbitrary. There have also been lots of papers on related knapsack and bin packing type problems. Uh, they are not related from a technique's point of view, but morally and 
uh, by looking at the problem statement, they look similar. There have been a lot of uh, other models uh, to handle stochasticity within combinatorial optimization. Again, uh, uh, it's not going to be related to us in terms of techniques. Uh, for stochastic load balancing, nothing was known before uh, our work, uh, even for related machines. So our main result is a constant approximation for uh, load balancing on unrelated machines. And uh, we can also extend these techniques in two directions. Uh, one is where you have a target number of jobs that you want to assign to machines and you want to minimize uh, the expected mean span of just some number k of jobs that you assign. Uh, so that extends this. We can still get a constant approximation. The other one is less of an extension. Um, but if you want to minimize, instead of the make span, the make span can be thought of as the log norm of the load vectors. If you have m machines and you look at uh, the log m norm of the load vectors, that is roughly the make span. So a natural question is to minimize some other norm of the load vectors, so some LQ norm uh, of the load vectors. Uh, then we can get a factor Q over log Q approximation. So this does not quite match the constant approximation as Q goes large. And that's a nice open question. So as I move to the more technical part of the talk, some of it is from prior work, and some of it is going to be uh, uh, the new stuff that we have been doing. So this is how uh, the effective size is defined, and this is going to be a very useful quantity. So I'll just write it on the board. So it's parameterized by an integer k, and you can think of k as the number of machines. So the effective size of random variable x is essentially a scaled form of the moment generating function. If you look at uh, the term over here, if you ignore the log k, then expectation of each dx is the moment generating function. So this is basically uh, uh, the logarithm of the moment generating function where you scale the random variable by an appropriate term. So you scale it by log k in the exponent, so log k times x, and you scale it back down by log k. So if x is deterministic, you, you're still getting the value of x. So this is this is going to be the effective size and morally this is going to be the deterministic proxy that we will use. So for every random variable we, we would want to work with this deterministic value and maybe we can do a quick calculation here. So let's see why this helps in the example that showed that just plain expectation is not a good idea. So if you have a Bernoulli run so so for the blue jobs which were deterministic, you just have one, and we're going to set this parameter k to be equal to m, which is the number of machines. And for the red jobs, which are Bernoulli with probability 1 over square root m, if you do the calculation, it turns out to be some constant, some constant like half. Okay, so you'll have uh, so this is going to, so inside the expectation you'll have, so x is going to be 0 with probability 1 minus 1 over square root m. So you have 1 minus 1 over square root m times 1 plus with probability 1 over square root m, x is going to be 1. And you're looking at e to the power of log m, which will give you m. Right, so, so this whole thing is roughly square root m. You're taking a log of that that's going to give you half log m and you're dividing by log m. Right? So the bottom line is both the red and the blue job now have deterministic size, which is roughly the same, which is what we wanted. Right? So if we go back to this example, because the effective sizes are comparable for both the blue and red jobs, if you did a lopsided assignment like that with the blue jobs individually sitting on these machines and the red jobs on these machines, then your main span in terms of this effective size will be square root of m. Because you have square root of m red jobs 
sitting on each of these machines. Whereas if you spread the red and blue jobs evenly, then uh, your make span in terms of the effective size is going to be utmost a constant because you have utmost two jobs in every machine. Okay, at least for this example, this shows that using the effective size as the deterministic processing time is a good idea. Okay, and that's, that's kind of the key result in the klein et al. paper. So this is just what I said. So formally, they show, I mean, under some caveat, that if you have an assignment that ensures that the effective size make span is at most one, then the expected make span is at most a constant. On the other hand, if you have an assignment where the make span under these effective sizes is larger than one, then the expected make span is at least some constant. So that's that's the heart of their argument. So, yes. so what is, is there another way of looking at this, understanding the effective size and the probability that the job is bigger than C times the effective size is very small? Or yeah, so we, we will see that. So you, uh, because of yeah. uh, this, uh, because of this exponential, so the moment generating function is used in tail bounds and those kind of uh, calculations would be needed in proving uh, this side of the argument. And we, and we will also see that. Okay. So, so the caveat I mentioned is that we can't quite map every random variable to a single deterministic value, no matter if it's the expectation or the effective size. In fact, the Kleinberg et al. paper showed that if you have any function that ma maps random variables to real numbers, then and then on top of that you use a deterministic load balancing algorithm, there is still a gap of log m over log m. But this is sort of a very, very sharp characterization. A function from random variables to a single real number is not enough, but basically mapping every random variable to two real numbers is enough. So the idea is to take every random variable and represent it using two numbers. Uh, for that, we're going to treat the random instantiations which are smaller than a guess on the optimal make span. So let's say this dashed line is our target make span. So we look at all instantiations of the random variable that fall below this, and that's going to be called the truncated part of the random variable. And all instantiations that fall above this, that's going to be called the exceptional part of the random instantiation. So the two deterministic values that we will care about for this random variable are the usual expectation for the exceptional items. So that's just taking the expected value. And this beta m value applied to the truncated. So you map every random variable into these two deterministic numbers, and then you do some load balancing, treating every random variable just as two numbers, and life is perfect. So you get a constant approximation. Okay. So moving to our setting of unrelated machines, uh, even if you're only looking at truncated random variables, it turns out it's not enough to just look at one particular number because we don't really know what is uh, the right choice for this parameter k. In identical machines, we always set it to be equal to the number of machines, but in unrelated machines, that's not quite clear. So here's a simple example. We have, again, two types of jobs, but now the distribution of these random variables are identical. They're all 0, 1 Bernoulli's with probability 1 over square root m. But uh, because we are in the setting of unrelated machines, we can enforce that jobs can go only to a certain subset of machines. So the blue jobs can go only to the first machine, whereas the red jobs can go to any machine. So that's the setup. So as long as we compute a single number for every job, we are going to have the same number for all these jobs. And because the blue jobs can only go on the very first machine, here is one possible optimal assignment. You assign all the uh, square root m blue jobs to the first machine, and you assign square root m red jobs to each of the each of other square root m machines. And if you use this as a solution to your stochastic problem, then you will again find that you are faced with the max of square root m Poisson random variables at three point. And so you are again going to have an expected mix span which is log over log log. M. And instead, you should have assigned all the blue jobs to one machine and smeared the red jobs uniform. And that would have given you 
a constant expected max value. Okay, so uh, what ends up working in this setting is to map every random variable to a vector of numbers. We are going to use all of these beta k values. So beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, all the way up to beta n. So not just uh, setting it equal to the number of machines. So if we use that, then we, we, can, we can use uh, further techniques that we know from the deterministic problem and, and get a constant approximation for unrelated machines. Okay, so before we go further, just a one slide summary of uh, how the two approximation algorithm for deterministic load balancing works. And this is a result of Lindstrush, Moise, and Tardish. So the first idea is to guess the optimal value and scale the data so that the optimum is actually equal to 1. And then based on that, we write a linear program for relaxation. It's the most natural linear program. Yij says whether I assign job j to machine i or not. You have to assign every job to exactly one machine, so those are the constraints. Zi is capturing what is the load induced on machine i. So that's just summation Pij times Yij. And if you want the make span to be at most 1, the load on every single machine has to be at most 1. Okay, so this is the most natural linear program you would write. You solve this linear program and you can round it to get a two approximate solution. So we are going to use similar ideas. Uh, but we need to work a little harder in coming up with an LP relaxation. So we need to identify certain valid inequalities that will be satisfied by the stochastic, uh, uh, to, that will capture the stochastic expected mean span value. Uh, we need to show that we can solve this LP relaxation. It turns out to have an exponential number of constraints, but we can solve it by separation. And then we also have to round the solution of this LP. Okay, so the remaining few minutes, I'll, I'll give an outline of these steps. Again, we are going to assume by scaling that the optimum is 1. So our goal is to get an assignment that has a constant expected mix span. So, so these are the valid inequalities that we use. Um, so uh, we'll use uh, Tij to be the truncated part of the random label, which is the part that is less than 1. For instantiations, less than 1. And Tij is going to be the part that's larger than 1. So I'm not going to prove this. I'll just uh, give a heuristic argument why something like this should be true. So if you have any assignment uh, that has expected make span at most 1, then these inequalities must be satisfied. So the first thing says that the total over all machines and all jobs assigned to that machine of the expectation, the regular expectation, of the exceptional random variables should be at most 2. And Morally, the reason this should be true is because any time one of these random variables uh, is non-zero, you are already exceeding your make span bound of 1. And if you knew that your expected make span is at most 1, this event cannot happen too often. Right? So it doesn't matter uh, whether these jobs are on the same machine or different machine, they just can't show up with a non-zero value too often because your expected make span has to be at most 1. The other set of constraints are uh, a little harder to parse, but these are some kind of volume constraints. So what this says is, if you look at any subset of k machines, so let's say I take these three machines, and I look at all the jobs that are assigned to these machines, and I measure the load of these jobs, so this is k equals 3, I measure the load induced by these jobs on these machines in terms of the parameter beta k. Then that should not be more than a constant. So this b over here is just a constant. It should not be more than a constant times the number of machines. So if you go back to the identical machine setting, uh, that is exactly uh, the heart of the argument in Kleinberg et al. which says that if you're going to map these jobs to m machines, then the total effective size cannot be more than constant times n. But you have, we need to apply this for all subsets of machines. Okay. So that's uh, good. So that these are the inequalities that we want to enforce. Based on that, we have this LP relaxation. Again, the Yij says whether or not job J is assigned to machine I. Now we have a load vector on every machine. Zi of k is measuring the load on machine I. 
uh, in terms of the effective size beta k. So k can range again from 1 to n. So every machine has a load vector, it's not just a number. And these equations are just calculating that. So this constraint over here says, says that the total exceptional size should not be more than 2. This was the first valid inequality we had. And these constraints are the volume constraints. Let's say that for every subset of k machines, if you measure your load in terms of beta k, it should not be more than constant times k. So these are sort of the hard part of this LP because the others are explicitly given and polynomial in number. So uh, it's not too hard to solve this LP using the ellipsoid method because we can solve the separation oracle, which is just sorting. We just need to sort the load, the load values. And because this has to be true for every subset, it has to be true for the subset of the largest ZIK values. That's, that's, that's all we need for the separation oracle. Uh, so we need to use the ellipsoid method. So this is certainly not a practical algorithm. So we solve the LP. We find that the LP is infeasible. Then our guess of the optimal mean span is wrong. And we have to continue uh, the guessing process. If it's feasible, then we are going to run a rounding algorithm. So the idea of the rounding is to try and satisfy all the constraints. But there are an exponential number of them. So there's not much hope uh, to satisfy all of them. But luckily, it's enough to satisfy only a subset of them. And how do we identify the subset that we want to satisfy? Uh, we uh, use a connection to this other scheduling problem called generalized assignment, which is exactly the same as unrelated machine scheduling, except you also have an extra uh, cost objective. So it's a problem where you want to minimize the cost of the assignment that has may expand at most one. And we utilize, again, a classic algorithm of Schmoyce and Tardish for this. So the key part point here is to define the instance of generalized assignment. Okay, so yeah, quick recap about the generalized assignment problem. You have processing time of each job J on machine I. You also have costs for assignments. And you have a bound on the target make span B. You can think of this as one. And you want to find, a, find an assignment that has make span at most this target. And subject to that, it minimizes your cost. So the result of Schmoyes and Tarder says that if the natural LP has an optimal value C star, then you can find an assignment that has cost at most C star, but may expand at most the target plus the maximum processing time. Okay, so this is LP relative, and we will need that. So yeah, you can ignore the text on top. I just explained how we define the instance by an example. The cost of assigning job J to machine I is just going to be the expectation of the exceptional part of the random variable. So that's the cost for every possible assignment. The processing times are defined in an iterative fashion. So first, we look at the set of all machines. In this example, we have five machines. And our volume constraint, if we apply it to the set of all five machines, we'll say that the total load on these five machines, in terms of the beta phi value, has to be at most five times this constant B which means that the average load of these machines is at most uh, some constant p. So there has to be at least one machine that has load at most p. So we find one such machine and define all the processing times going into that machine to be the beta phi values. So for this very first machine, the processing time of j to that machine is going to be beta phi of that random value. Now we are going to iterate with the remaining subset of machines. Now we have remaining four machines. And we look, if we look at the volume constraint for that subset, we know that the total beta 4 value is going to be at most 4 times b. So again, by averaging, there has to be at least one machine, could be more, which has beta 4 load on it to be at most b. So for those two machines, we are going to say that the pig values are equal to the beta 4 values of those random And we iterate this un until we are done with all the machines. So that defines all the pigs. Uh, to set up the generalized assignment instance, it's easy to see by the way we are constructing this that the very same LP solution, the YIG assignment we have, is going to be feasible for this instance of generalized assignment, and it will give us a cost of at most two. Okay, so I just have one slide on the analysis, so uh, we'll go through that quickly. So we've now boiled down to the generalized assignment instance and a feasible fractional solution to it. So if we round it, we are going to ensure that the cost does not increase. So it's going to be still at most 2. And we know that the make span is going to increase by at most 
p max, the maximum processing time, which in this case is 1. So from some constant b, we go to a slightly bigger constant b plus 1. Now we need to see how this integer assignment will behave when we measure expected mean span. Right? So we have to go back to the stochastic objective. Because of this, we can see that even the total contribution from exceptional items is at most 2. So that's good. And now if we use the definition of these effective sizes and use a calculation that shows up in Chernoff bounds, uh, we can show that the probability that uh, for machine i, the load becomes larger than its expectation, which is, or this value d plus 1 plus some alpha is exponentially dropping in this deviation alpha. And the base of this exponent is uh, the class of the machine. So when we sort of, uh, how, how we define the PIG values. And we know that there are not too many machines of each class because we were at least uh, sort of making, re removing one machine as we were iterating through this process so we can get a bound on, on this and, and we can apply a union bound over all the machines. Okay, so that's, that's all I have to say. So, right, so, so this problem was introduced to study routing and networks. So, natural question is can we do uh, things like unsplittable flow? That you want to find paths. So, let's say single source unsplittable flow. You want to find a path for every demand so that when the random variables instantiate, you minimize the expected mix span. That still seems out of reach uh, from, from the techniques we have here. More questions? No? Okay.